Hey, good morning, and thanks everyone for joining us at St. Pete Collegiate High School. This school is a great example of how our state provides unique opportunities and options for students of the state of Florida. At St. Pete's Collegiate High School, students can earn a high school diploma and an AA degree at the same time at campuses here in St. Petersburg as well as at camp campuses in Tarpon Springs. And the great thing about that, you have precisely zero debt when you graduate with your high school diploma and your uh, AA degree. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody who's here today. Dr. Williams, thank you for, for hosting us here. Speaker Chris Sprouse, uh, thank you uh, for being here. Richard Corcoran, Commissioner of Education, um, on his uh, sunset tour as the <laughs> Commissioner of Education. And uh, he's done a lot. I mean, you know, we have a great announcement today and a great bill signing, but you know, the speaker and the commissioner were just talking. If you look at all that we've done in education over the last three years, I mean, three, four years, I mean, it's been huge. This session, there are things no one's even noticed that are done that are gonna be really significant. And so we're gonna be highlighting um, a lot of those. I also wanna thank representatives Latvala and Cheney uh, here in Pinellas County for being here. And then we have teachers from uh, the Collegiate High School, Zanetta Robinson and Daniel Walsh. Uh, we also have parents, Lainey Gibney, as well as our Florida Teacher of the Year, Sarah Painter. And we have Darcy Eckert. So I want to thank all of them uh, for being here uh, to, um, to share in this uh, really momentous bill signing. So today, we come not to praise the FSA, but to bury it. We are here today with legislative leaders to officially eliminate the FSA from the state of Florida. Now, six months ago, I announced legislative proposal to replace the FSA with progress monitoring. Instead of having one major test at the very end of the year, which provided no feedback to students uh, before the summer came, uh, we would do progress monitoring that would monitor progress throughout the school year. It would be shorter, it would be more individualized, uh, and it would provide good feedback for students, for teachers, uh, and for parents. Um, and so I want to thank Richard Corcoran for really uh, bringing this to the forefront. I remember him briefing on briefing this to me a couple years ago saying, okay, we're going to do, we're going to do the teacher salary this year. Then we're going to do that. And then we are going to do the progress monitoring. And basically what he was doing was looking to see what has worked best um, in different uh, school environments. And this type of, of assessment uh, was much more effective than kind of the big study for weeks, all the marbles on the last test, and then, then adjourn for the summer. Um, and so we think this is gonna be uh, an improvement in the state of Florida. You know, we did, we needed some tool to be able to assess and we do believe in accountability. We're gonna to continue to do that because it's important to have, house, have high standards. At the same time, if you look at what's been innovated, you look at new technology, uh, we can get the same information from the FSA in a much shorter period of time and in a way that provides really quick feedback uh, for parents, teachers, and students. And we want the parent uh, to be able uh, to be involved in this, to get that feedback alongside the teacher, and then both can work to help remediate if students, um, in fact, need that. Now, under the FSA, students, parents, and teachers would receive the results after the school year. Well, it was too late to do anything about that. How are you going to remediate if you see problems when people are already out for the summer? The FSA doesn't give parents and teachers room to have those important conversations about what is best for the child's education. And of course, by the time those conversations could even happen, you have a new school year and you have a new teacher. And so by eliminating FSA and transitioning to progress monitoring, uh, we are really going to help uh, bolster the conversations between parents and teachers uh, and so they can work together to make sure that our kids succeed. So under this new approach, three administrations of progress monitoring, this will take hours, not days, and it will reduce overall testing time dramatically. Uh, now by law, the fall and winter results must be provided to teachers within one week and parents within two weeks, which allows real-time real intervention before it's too late. Parents can reinforce classroom learning at home. The spring results must be provided to students, parents, and teachers within one week. We know this works because most schools that have used progress monitoring uh, in early education have done so successfully. And so here's how we're going to implement this change. This school year, for the class of 2022, or the, everyone in 2022 spring, 
this will be the last time the FSA is administered in the state of Florida. Next year, Florida will become the first state in the nation to do a full transition to progress monitoring to inform school accountability. The 2022-23 school year will serve as a new baseline for school accountability, a quote, hold harmless transition year, and school grades will resume the following year. This will happen while maintaining the successful components of Florida's accountability system that has seen Florida students grow and that has seen achievement gaps close over the last two decades. Now, nothing in this legislation is going to change the fact uh, that schools will uh, be graded, um, and it will obviously, the results of the test are going to be the results of the test, and, and we're going we're to take those results very seriously. Um, but, uh, and of course, we're still going to focus on students' readiness and growth. However, uh, we're going to collect and deliver information in less time, more frequently. Uh, there will be more time for learning under this progress monitoring system, and you will have much, much more feedback. So this is a huge streamlining of what we've been doing, um, and I think it's teacher friendly, I think it's student friendly, and I think it's parent friendly. So I want to thank the legislature for doing it. And if you think, look at all that, that we've done over the last uh, uh, several years, we're right now, the latest Education Week rankings that came out, I guess, last year has Florida number three for K-12 achievement. Uh, I think we were maybe in the top 20 uh, three, three, four years ago. Now we're in the top five. Um, we've done things like take bold moves to eliminate Common Core and replace them with our world-class best standards that was devised uh, under the Department of Education supervision. Uh, we have invested in our educators raising the minimum teacher pay to one of the highest levels in the nation. Uh, and if you look at what we did in this recent budget, uh, over the last three years, we will have over $2 billion in compensation increases for teachers uh, throughout the state of Florida. So that's a huge, huge deal. This year we have historic per pupil funding, which is second year in a row we've done that. Uh, and then of course you go back, probably one of the most significant things we did summer of 2020 while people were saying you know you couldn't send kids to school we said you know what these are not high risk environments we understand the data but we also understand how disastrous it would be to lock these kids out of school every parent in florida had a right to send their kid to, to school in person five days a week and we had school districts across this country teachers rise to the challenge when people were saying that we were doing the wrong thing. Well, now I think you look back a couple years later, uh, the places that locked the kids out of school for a year, 18 months, they did immense damage to these students. And you know where that damage is focusing on? It's focusing on low and working class families. The wealthy students families who were doing Zoom and part of the laptop class, they would bring in tutors, they'd send their kids to private schools. You actually had lockdown governors and local officials would lock down schools and then send their own kids in person to private schools. That is wrong. And so we made sure that all students in Florida had the opportunity uh, to do that. We're much better off for it. And then we've also doubled down uh, on early learning and early literacy. We're gonna have some great announcements. This year we did a lot uh, under the speaker's leadership last year. Uh, and then we've put more of an emphasis on civics education than any other state in the country. We have more uh, that we're gonna be able to talk about after this le legislative session. And uh, we're gonna continue doing that. So, so uh, I'm just happy that we have so many people in the legislature, uh, throughout our state, that really understand how important education is. Uh, we've worked incredibly hard. Uh, we've been able to achieve an awful lot. And um, you know, this matters, and this matters big time, and it's going to matter um, not only now, but, but far into the future. So we've got a lot of folks that are going to come up and uh, be able to offer some comments, and I look forward to hearing from them all. So we will start with our Speaker of the House and Pinellas County native, Chris Sprouse. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for being here at, at St. Pete College. Our, our Florida uh, State Colleges are leading the way in workforce education, and right here in Pinellas County, St. Pete College is the tip of that spear. Uh, Governor, it's great to be with you today with, with Commissioner Corcoran, Chairman Latval, Representative Cheney, to talk about this, this great bill. But one thing I want to mention, the Governor said that Florida is you know, number three in the nation in K-12 student achievement. You know, most, most individuals, most states who go to that level, rise to that level of recognition, kind of lay off the gas, 
They say, you know, we've gotten so, so far, we've done so well, let's just make sure we maintain. But not this governor, not this commissioner of education, not this legislature. We haven't looked behind us, we've kept our pedal to the metal. Governor, you deserve credit. Uh, for making sure that we continue to push forward at high speeds because we know at the end of the day the people who are going to win when we hit the pedal to the metal is Florida's kids and Florida's families and that's what this session was all about. Uh, I'm grateful to the governor and Commissioner Corcoran, Chairman Lavalla, Representative Placencia who carried this bill. This bill is about parents and kids. You know, taking away the stress of a, you know, one size fits all test, making sure that we're, you know, we're monitoring children throughout the course of the school year. And most importantly, that parents can react to the information. Isn't that what we all want as parents? Give me the information so that I can help my kid be successful. Are they struggling in reading? Are they struggling in math? What can I do? to help them. That is what this bill is for, to make sure that parents have that information so that they can react. And you know, the governor is going to have the opportunity, and, and hopefully I'll get to be there with Commissioner Corcoran and others throughout the next course of the several months, to talk about all the wins in education and how those other programs, whether it's a reading scholarship or the ability to get a tutor at your school, what all of these pieces that fit into a bigger puzzle of putting kids and families first in Florida's education. Governor, I couldn't be more proud to stand with you today and, and the members of the legislature and Commissioner Corcoran to make sure that Floridians know we're fighting for their families and we're fighting for their kids. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next, I'd like to introduce Lainey Gibney. She's a, a foster mom of two girls, 10-year-old and 12-year-old, uh, who joined, joined us here today. She's also a social worker, so she can speak about how this will impact not only her daughters, but also the children she works with every day. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for inviting me and my two little ones here today. Right now, kids have to take a two-day test at the end of every year. We as parents don't get those results until well into summer, which is too late to support any deficits and help our children wherever they may need it. As a mother to foster children, I can attest that the current testing schedule and environment negatively impacts children's self-esteem, mental health, and access to academic support. Our children are told to get a good night's sleep and eat a healthy breakfast and, and get a, in the right mindset in preparation for the current testing schedule. But those are luxuries that many of our children do not have access to on a consistent basis. The FSA is only set up for high performing and exceptionally supported students. But what about those students who are average or even struggling? What about students like my children who had substantial barriers early in their childhood education. When I heard that our state was changing to a new system that reduces anxiety and stress that school children face, I was thrilled. For my children, I want our schools to have an assessment that truly captures their brilliance and instills confidence in them. I want my children to enjoy school and to look forward to demonstrating how much they have learned and grown over the years something that is tailored to their individual needs. So thank you, Governor, not just for this bill, but for all the work you've done in the education and foster care system. As a mom of two precious girls, this truly means the world to us. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to introduce Sonetta Robinson. She's a teacher at St. Pete Collegiate High School, and she has seen how progress monitoring can help engage her students and better ensure their success. Thank you, Governor. Greetings, Governor DeSantis, President Williams, Speaker Sprouls, Representative Latvala, Commissioner Cochran, parents, educators, guests, Floridians. My name is Zanetta Robinson, and I teach sophomores at St. Petersburg Collegiate High School's North Pinellas campus in Tarpon Springs. This morning, I'm going to spend a few moments telling you the story of two students with two separate college and career ready goals, a teacher, a governor, a legislature, and progress monitoring. In 2020, I had an underachieving student who needed a passing FSA score. She was close, so close. In fact, she come close on more than one occasion. Like the dedicated teacher I am, I used her ninth grade data to create a tool to monitor her learning and inform my guide and guide my individualized instruction for her. 
though I had no real way of knowing or predicting how she'd later perform on the high stakes, high stakes FSA, we used the progress monitoring tool I created and we labored on, fingers crossed. There was no FSA in 2020. In 2021, amid much angst, stress, hang, hand wringing, uh, and just st stress beyond imagining, she got the score that she needed. She was stressed, but she did it. In 2021, I had a student who needed to improve her PERT score to demonstrate her college readiness. As a teacher, I knew I could use my best practices to help her reach her goal. But in 2021, something new and exciting happened. Our governor, Ron DeSantis, reached out from his office in Tallahassee, took my hand and said, together, we've got this. Let's do what's right for Florida's teachers, students, and families. He implemented progress monitoring. Now the student had low stakes, accurate descriptions of her readiness. I had a low stakes, real time way to inform my instructional practice. Her family had, a, had information and most importantly, hope. I used the data, the student got the score she needed. Two students with two separate college and career readiness goals, a teacher, a governor, a legislature, and progress monitoring. The students met their two different college and career ready goals. The teacher got the support and data she needed to inform her practice. The governor, supported by the legislature, instituted a plan that empowers Florida's families and protects Florida's number one in the nation accountability system. The too long didn't read version is this. Progress monitoring is right for kids. It's right for teachers, it's right for families, it's right for Florida. Thank you. Okay, next we're gonna hear from Daniel Walsh. He's been an educator for more than 30 years. Uh, he's uh, excited about progress monitoring, not only as a teacher, but also as a parent. And like many of his students, even though both of his children are strong learners, um, they spent a lot of time focusing on testing uh, at the expense of um, learning, and they basically would relearn at the end of the year just to do the test. And so uh, he's gonna come up and say a few things. Good morning. Hello, my name is Dan Walsh. I'm a teacher at the St. Pete, Petersburg. Sorry, I'm not used to speaking in front of a group of people. St. Petersburg Collegiate High School. This campus here is an amazing campus. And yes, I do have two students who went through the Pinellas County School System, and they did actually have to go through the progress monitoring, I mean, through the standardized testing system. And I remember the days as a parent, um, listening to the stories about preparing for the test before the test, and making sure as a parent we, we, they would get a good night's sleep, which is not always easy with a teenager, and make sure they have a hearty breakfast before they actually take the test. And there's, like I said, there's multiple days of that, and the anxiety of, of waiting for the results to show up. It took months for the results to show up, and then after that, we had, it was too late to make any changes. So as an effective teacher here at Pinellas County Schools and teaching for a long time, every effective teacher knows progress monitoring works. You start with a lesson, and you give assessments along the way, formative assessments to determine how the students are doing. Those assessments determine my lesson plans. I would change my lesson plans on a daily basis, saying, okay, they didn't do so well in that assessment. Let's see what happened and retool and go back and relearn. Mm -hmm. And actually that's what we really need to do. That's what progress monitoring, progress monitoring is all about. Going back and re retooling, re re uh, teaching the students what they need to know that they lost along the way. Progress monitoring is an exceptional model. And it's really gonna help the students, especially the ones who struggle with testing that standardized tests. Many students have test anxiety and they get in sort of a side of a room SAT room or FSA room, and they sit there and they know the weight of that test, the importance of that test, and that determines their whole future. So they know that it's really critical to do well, and then when they don't do well, they feel as a failure as a student. Unfortunately, as, as educators, we know all year long we're giving them positive reinforcement. They can do it. You can get through this, and all year long we're giving them positive feedback. It's not until the end of the year when they take an FSA that they find out that maybe they weren't so good, and that destroys their, their character, which we never want to do as teachers. So F progress monitoring is an excellent idea. It's an excellent model for, for effective teaching, and I want to thank Pro Governor DeSantis for actually implementing this bill. It's going to change lives, lots of lives, from this future on. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. 
Okay, we have Dr. Williams, president of St. Pete College. So she's gonna talk about uh, some of the great work that they're doing here and what this means for them. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Governor DeSantis, Speaker Sprouls. Um, I am so grateful to you for your work. Commissioner Corcoran, Chair Latvala, and Representative Cheney, thank you so much for being here today. On behalf of St. Petersburg College's Board of Trustees, faculty, and staff, welcome to St. Petersburg College. We are in the Joseph H. Lang Student Success Center. Thank you, Speaker Sprouls, um, for helping us build this, this center. We just want to let you know that Governor DeSantis's leadership has been very instrumental in many ways. This is just one of those many ways. What he has done over time has been really extremely focused, extremely focused on K through 12 because he knew that our K through 12 students are our future. If we're going to make Florida the number one workforce state, we've got to build the workers. And to do that, they must finish high school and finish high school on time and prepared for the work that we have laid upon us. He's done a lot of work on school safety and mental health and especially workforce education. Thank you for that. Early learning and VPK and the list goes on. We could be here for hours to talk about the impact that Governor DeSantis has made. The expansion of school choice and opportunities for parents is one that's very important. He wanted to make sure that parents were empowered to make a decision for education specifically tailored to their children. This is important, and for the parents who are not taking advantage, it's your choice. But the choice is there. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for that. I also want to thank you for your leadership that supported us in offering a new workforce-based collegiate high school, the St. Petersburg Collegiate STEM High School. Students will simultaneously earn a high school diploma and an AS degree, preparing them for work at the same time. They will also earn two industry certifications along with their AS degree. Talk about changing the game. That's exactly what Governor DeSantis has done. And I want to thank Commissioner Corcoran for his support on the Collegiate High School. Um, that's going to be very critical and a game changer for us. So what exactly does progress monitoring do? In my opinion, as college president, it strengthens the pipeline. It helps students gain confidence, help them be more prepared for post-secondary education, whether they attend a technical college, a university, or the great 28 of the Florida college system. How great it's going to be for the student and parent to learn up front those leading indicators that share with students and parents how well they're doing. And to be able to create an individualized plan to help students who need that extra help succeed. Man, I would have loved to have had that when I was in high school. Progress monitoring further ensures that our students are ready, they are capable to be good with academics and their careers. The Florida College System Institutions receives a large number of graduates from our local high schools. The more successful they are in high school indicates greater success in college. We look forward to maximizing the achievement of each learner, ensuring a lucrative career path, and meeting the needs of our community. Because together, we can and we will accelerate Florida. Thank you. Okay, last and sometimes I say least, but you know, <laughs> I gotta rib him on the way out. Although we're gonna do so many education uh, bill signings over the next uh, a few weeks that we're gonna keep him busy all the way um, out the door. But uh, you know, Richard Corcoran, as I mentioned, was really came to me you know a couple years ago about this saying we need to do a lot of different things, but build to being able to make this change and. Um, it was something that I really wasn't as familiar about in terms of progress monitoring, and it was something that they had looked at very seriously. They were very impressed with uh, the, the way it had been done, particularly as we have new technology. I mean, you have uh, a whole host of, of ways to be able to make this very effective and user-friendly. And so he says, we've got to do it. And I'm like, okay, I'm convinced. And so we went ahead and chartered the course. Last year, we did the press conference. Uh, we said this is what we were going to do. Uh, and then the legislature has delivered, and we will come full circle and sign it in the law today. So come on up, Richard. 
I just want to clarify the reason he says least a lot is because on his uh, annual charitable golf tournament, I'm his worst golfer on the governor's team. <laughs> I really score a point and you get a point this year, I though, did, right? I yeah. did. I finally <laughs> scored. I finally got on the board. But uh, I just want to say it's a great day and, and the, uh, the governor is, is dead on. One of the silver linings, if there was a silver lining um, to COVID is when we had to cancel testing when COVID hit, and then we were looking at the data and pouring over it with the governor, and what we saw was that the progress monitoring data that did not cease for those students was just as enlightening to us on, on where those students were and what they needed to do as this very elaborate, laborious FSA. And so that was the beginning of, of the change that you're seeing today, and, and the governor said it well. Accountability has changed just so much in the state of Florida and who it elevates more than anybody else are the least fortunate, the, those with the least voice. Accountability has taken, whether it's uh, students with disabilities, low income students, minority students, and elevated them greater than any state in the country over the last um, decade. And, but that doesn't mean you rest, you know, to what Speaker Sproul said, this governor is always pushing the envelope. How do we have a better accountability system, the best accountability system? And progress monitoring, and everyone said it, I don't wanna repeat it, but now you're getting something that's fairer to teachers because now the teachers are getting that real-time data throughout the year it's much more helpful to parents and most importantly it's beneficial to students so in September when they do that initial progress morning they could say oh you know, Sally's struggling with conjunctions. We need to really focus with her on conjunctions. It's very diagnostic and it's very specific to the child. And no place in the state is a better example of why progress monitoring is absolutely the accountability system we want. Because right here in Pinellas County, there is an elementary school that went from a low F to an A overnight and they will tell you it was through progress monitoring constantly knowing what every individual child needed to succeed on the on the ultimate fsa and the governor has said it what we're doing now um, not only does it relieve of the anxiety and that and that pressure but it's also done in half the time and so now classroom instruction will proceed for another month over what we do in previous years because we'll be able to just minimize and streamline that testing and finally i'll say this um, the, the Speaker Sproul said it beautifully. This is literally what you've seen over the last four years. And I, I was served in the legislature. I had the honor of being a speaker. What's happened in the last four years, uh, four sessions under Governor DeSantis is not amazing. It has never been accomplished in American history in a state. It's that dramatic. And, and, and you've heard it from the president. You've heard it from Speaker Sprouls. This is just one piece of that puzzle. And that puzzle, which is pretty, getting pretty complete, is a beautiful canvas of art. Um, and, and you've heard it from uh, whether it's choice, whether it's the elimination of Common Core, where it's a focus on early literacy, getting books into children's hands that can otherwise not get them in, in the, in the, in the uh, New World's Initiative, whether it's a civics literacy and making sure people are ready to be great citizens and understand what it means to be a person in a self-governing society, whether it's choice and the expansion and the access to it, whether it's the elevation of teacher pay to bottom 25 to top five in the entire country. What has happened in the last four sessions in education is staggering. And what it is is a beautiful canvas, a beautiful piece of art, and what it leads to, and, you, and, and I, I like what the professor said is you're changing children's lives not just their minds but their hearts and and there's no longer a question of if Florida will be number one in the country the question now is when when we start getting the measurement and back to normalcy with the other 50 states you will see that Florida is hands down number one in k-12 education and it's all because of this guy behind us and so thank you so much governor okay well let's get it in the books Today's date is uh, the 13th? 15th. 15th. Oh, yeah, because we were the, the, the session ended a couple days later, so I knew the, the session end date. Um, all right, well, this will be good. So. First. Who else? Oh, of course, always. Anybody else? 
teacher. Yep. There we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's a, this is a big deal, guys, right here. Really big. You got it? Okay. Good stuff. Thank you. So we're uh, we're obviously excited. It's um, you know it's it's a big deal. Um, you know there's certain things you can do that that we think have been really significant. Like a lot of what we've done on workforce education, for example, we think is really path breaking. But the fact is, you know, not most students aren't going to utilize that. They they will do other other paths, which is great. Um, but this is one that will impact every student um, in the state of Florida, and so we think it's going to be a positive impact. Uh, we think it'll increase um, uh, academic performance. We think it'll be more accurate measurement, and we think it's something that parents and teachers alike um, are going to be uh, going to be happy about. So, uh, good day, all in all. And with that, we could take yes, ma'am. So, so I've said, I mean, I, I, I was, um, you, you know, very receptive to, to seeing some reforms. I also think, you know, it's taken so long to, to review this, and this is an elaborate process. I think if that had been done and they had teed up what happened, I think you would have probably gotten something done. So, so we are going to get the definitive answer from this, and I think that if that gives rise to something, I do think you'll see the legislature do something now. I was, I was, um, you know, I was, I was receptive to it, um, but you know, and maybe Chris can say a few things about it. But, but that's just kind of, um, you know, these things in session. Sometimes they don't agree. Uh, but I can tell you this: uh, we, uh, we want to make sure, of course, everybody's safe. We want to make sure that that we honor those families uh, with an added. And I, the legislature did. You guys did fund some for the memorial, correct? Into the, into the budget. Um, and if there's something that, that can be done, I would like to see it on my desk to be able uh, to make sure that, that folks feel, feel good about these, these buildings. Yes, ma'am? It's funded. They fund it in the budget. You fully funded it in the budget. Yep. Do you remember what the line item was? How much? I don't. I yeah. Don't so I mean, it's it's not like an insignificant amount, but it isn't like an eye-popping amount relative to the budget. So that's funded. They did it, and so we've got. I think it's about 15 million. Yeah, and it'll save money over time. Yeah, and, and it will save money over time when, when you're implementing it. So yeah, so there should be no concerns about the financial. Uh, we met that 100%, and and that 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 I think that was uh, we, we we needed to do that. I mean, this is a state assessment, so that's. No, they're going to do the FSA because that's what was in the law and that's how they started the school year. But we said that if, if what we were successful, that this would be the, the last uh, last year. I remember we were down the we were down the road uh, with the first lady at, at Seminole uh, High School when we did uh, we did uh, an event with the big auditorium. We were talking about uh, some of the anti drug initiatives that that they're that they're working on. And I just said in passing, I said, guys. I don't know if you're involved in petitioning your legislature, but if we get this progress monitoring bill, then this will be the last year of the FSA. They all cheered, so I think that was fun. <laughs> but we did say this is going to be the last year. But yes, sir. There won't be any leniency because of the COVID absences. That's what I'm wondering. I don't, Richard, is it, is it just full? It's a yeah. Normal yeah, normal school year. Yes, sir. We, 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 and if we can get you some of the leniency that we have already provided. Yep. Well, look, I think, you know, you know, just as somebody who grew up in Pinellas County um, and, you know, the Navy took me to the other coast, I met my wife and everything, and, and, uh, but my parents still live in the same house, to see the performance out of Tampa Bay area, I mean, you've had a huge impact made for this region 
by these legislators and our senators, um, you know, Senator Simpson up in Pasco. So um, this region really had I probably unprecedented heft in the last two legislative sessions. And I think that such a dynamic area. There's a lot of other leaders coming up in the ranks who are impressive, but um, but 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 this is this has been a pretty good run uh, for the Tampa Bay area, and um, you know. We're, we're losing Chris Sprouls, we're losing some of the others, but we're regaining Tom Brady, so that's not a bad... <laughs> I don't know. Yes, ma'am. I think I think it's inaccurate. I think I think it's it, it is designed to potentially lead to a legal challenge of Florida's redistricting amendments because I think if you look at how those amendments are crafted, some of the case law that came in the middle of the last decade, which is what kind of the legislature followed, and I understand why they did that. It's our view that if you honestly take that text history and structure seriously that that's much broader than what would be countenance under the 14th amendment so it's really a challenge to florida's amendments it would not be a vehicle to challenge say section 5 of the voting rights act partially because section 5 of the voting rights act isn't even applicable because with the pre-clearance formula being done you would actually have to show really significant pervasive discrimination in order to have a race-based remedy. When Section 5 was done, you would have parts of the country where the, where the African-American turnout was like 8%. I mean, obviously, they were not being allowed to vote. Now you have turnout rates that are much higher across the board. So I think it'd be very, very difficult to show that. But I don't think our dispute would lead to that. I think our dispute very well may lead to uh, saying that Florida's redistricting amendments are not consistent with the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Yes, ma'am. So which um, which one is that? You're talking about 1557? Is that the curriculum yeah, transparency? transparency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I think I have not reviewed it, but I, I champion curriculum transparency. I think it's important that, that parents know, um, you know, what's going on. And um, the, the term limits for school board, I'm a big believer in term limits. I think it should be eight years, two terms. They did three terms, which, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's fine. And I'm not going to, I wouldn't veto the bill just over that. But if it were a standalone measure, I would have insisted on, on just two terms uh, for school board members, because I think that that's enough time for you to go serve, get stuff done. I mean, honestly, you know, you mentioned losing some of these legislators. I'm a huge believer in term limits. I think what term limits does is, you know, it tells these legislators, your time is limited. You come in, leave a legacy. Instead, in Washington, where they don't have term limits, what is the incentive to do? The incentive for them is to get elected and stay there as long as they can, and to stay there for decades, create these little fiefdoms, and it's all about just going back in. And I think like someone like Sprout, Chris Sprouts knew he was going to be speaker for two, for, for two years. Uh, he built up a legislative portfolio leading into that, and he knew he had to get the big things he wanted to accomplish done. He wasn't going to have, he wasn't going to be able to be speaker for 10 years or 15 years. I think that's good because what it does is it, it puts more of a focus on substantive achievements rather than posturing for the next election. So I'm a big believer in term limits. I think the, the eight years in the House is good. The eight years in the Senate in Florida is good. I would like to have seen that in school board as well. Look, is the 12 the worst thing in the world? Maybe it could be good because we do have some in the state that have been really entrenched for a long time. I think you go in achieve some things and then and then go and so that's really the model um, that I'd like to do and I could tell you people will sometimes ask me like um, you know you know Florida's run so much better than DC what 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 could DC do and and one of the things I said that if I could wave a magic wand there's a number of things I would do but one of them is term limits for members of Congress. If we could term limit members of Congress, 
you would be able to bring in new blood, you'd be able to bring in new ideas. Uh, people would have an incentive to go in and say, hey, I may only have three terms in the U.S. House, I want to get something done instead of kind of doing what they've really gone into a, a big morass and just in terms of how they do business. And so, so that provision is something that, um, you know, I, I think would have been better at eight. I know, I think Chris wanted it at eight. I think the Senate wanted it, so they had to compromise. Um, but nevertheless, that's, uh, that's that. Okay. What do you think, Richard? You like it or no? Not, not only should it not be elected, it shouldn't be a commissioner. It should be a, I should be a secretary. Okay, come on in. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the person most accountable to the people is the governor. He's the one who gets elected, and then when he gets elected, he should be the one who chooses who his cabinet is. And I'm one of the few or only um, cabinet person that answers to a commission. That was the compromise way back in when they got rid of the elected uh, commissioner. But I think just like in the federal level, just like in most states, that a commissioner of education should be a cabinet person. I shouldn't be a commissioner. I should be a secretary. And I should answer to the governor. And, and I think that's the best system that's accountable to the people. So not no. And, and, well, I mean, and, and he said cabinet. I mean, I think cabinet is kind of like how we would view the federal. As a, but I mean, in Florida, that has a little bit different meaning. So I don't think he would actually be a member of the, the cabinet. He'd be a member of an executive agency head. Look, this just goes back to kind of political theory. You know, if you go back and read Alexander Hamilton on how the Constitution was structured, read Hamilton on how he talks about executive authority, he would not have liked parts of the Florida Constitution. He would not have liked the fact that you have a cabinet uh, system of government where the executive power is splintered in certain areas. I mean, for example, FDLE, the head of that agency is all four cabinet members acting together. There's not actually one person who's accountable for FDLE. Hamilton hated that. He thought there had to be one person that was accountable, one person that could make the decisions, and you'd have a very clear chain of command. And so Florida's constitution is different from the federal uh, uh, constitution in that respect. Uh, but I do agree, you know, if you come in uh, as, as a governor, you want to be able to have your team in place. Now, granted, the board, I recommended Richard, the board, I think other people were willing to apply, but, but Richard was really a good candidate, so they did it. But I think it is important that you go in and, and have a unified team uh, for that. And I think Richard, uh, you know, has done a good job uh, with doing that. But definitely, if you look at kind of how the founders and compare Florida, there's definitely, uh, let's put it this way, in the 60s when they did our state constitution, they were absolutely departing from some of Hamilton and Madison's insights on that. There's people that are critical of Hamilton and Madison. I can tell you, if you look back in American history, there are not very many people that are smarter than Alexander Hamilton. I mean, this guy was absolutely unbelievable. And I think if you read him on executive power, on the judicial power, I'm not sure anybody uh, has surpassed him and he, we've had over 240-odd years uh, to be able to do it. Okay, everybody, we'll take you. Take care.